In today's show, I'm going to talk about setting up an NBA fantasy league, all the settings, what to do in this COVID environment, the different formats. So almost like a, uh, a show that's for beginners, but for advanced people as well who want to know the best settings or how to, how to differentiate the sit- settings for your league. This is too much. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed. Are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. As I said, we're going into a series of how-to uh, podcasts now leading into things like sleepers and busts later on. And just a, a quick, uh, actually, let's rephrase that. This week, what we're going to be doing is having how to, what today is, how to set up a league, how to uh, do an auction draft, how to do a snake draft, how to punt categories. So that's going to be this week, right? And then what we're going to do. So everyone who's asking me the questions, Josh, are you going to have positional tiers videos? Yes. Josh, are you going to have mock drafts? Absolutely, I am. Josh, are you going to talk about um, yeah, players in different situations? Yes. Everything that I do always is going to be back this year. The only thing I won't be doing, most likely, I might try and find a way to squeeze it in, but I'm not sure, is the team previews. But I'm not sure. That's just that's It's 30 shows, and we obviously don't have 30 days, plus all the other shit that needs to get done. So that's probably one that might get squeezed, but we'll see. Maybe we'll do something with that. So for everybody asking, yes, mock drafts are coming. Yes, sleepers and busts, and you know, getting guys on Yahoo and ESPN and looking at their rankings, injury risks, first, second, third year, fourth year players, all of that stuff we are going to cover in the coming weeks. I said I was maybe going to do a free agency show today. Nothing major has happened. Dario Saric went back to Phoenix. DeMarcus Cousins just signed with the Rockets. That's possibly going to cut into Christian Wood's minutes. But remember, uh, Boogie's barely played in the last two, three years. So it's hard to get too excited about Boogie's value. I don't think he's going to be playing you know, 30 minutes a night or anything close to that. Uh, that Houston team still a, a lot up in the air with what happens with Harden and, of course, what happens with Westbrook. Uh, yeah, a lot of uncertainty with that Rockets team. So I'm not going to do a free agent signing show to uh, talk about what happened with Wenyan Gabriel. All of those free agency moves, you can see them. But pretty much rosters are set. I'm smashing through projections now, just a couple of teams to go. And we are aiming, hopefully, this week to have Basketball Monster open. Uh, just got to test a few things to get those projections finished off. So let, let's talk about what I'm actually talking about today. And that is setting up a fantasy league. So first thing you got to decide when you're setting up a league is what league are you doing? Like, what is your league? What is the type of league that you are setting up? Is it a head-to-head category league? It should be. Absolutely. These are by far the best sort of leagues. Head-to-head each category or head-to-head most category is the way that is the decision you have to make. Now, what that means is that you have your categories, eight categories, nine categories, 11 categories. I would really recommend not going past nine. You can switch things in and out, but if you get into too many categories, it just becomes too much of a shit show. So I'd try to keep those numbers limited. Each category is each category that you have is a win. So if you win points or assists or steals, you get a point for each of those. Most categories is whoever wins the most categories each week gets one win. So in each category, you can have a 5-4 victory. You can have a 6-3 victory. In a most categories league, you win one win, zero losses. That is all it is. It is margin of victory is not important in a most categories league. So it does change your strategy a little bit. Punting becomes a little bit more important in a most categories league because all you need to do is win 5-4 and you can win every single week. Whereas in an each category, if you're winning 5-4, um, yeah, there are going to be teams who end up better than you. But in the playoffs, you tend to have a little bit more of an advantage there. Rotisserie is probably the format that I'd be looking at for this season because of the way that the coronavirus is spreading throughout the United States. There are going to be players miss games. There are going to be games canceled. Head-to-head, if you're looking at one-week matchups, you're going to have so many wild things happen with players sitting, with teams quarantining, with uh, yeah, multiple uh, players sitting out, that it's going to be really hard to get a solid head-to-head league going. Roto is a league that is basically what you're doing. So using categories, but you're competing over the course of a full season. 
you are competing um, against everybody at all times, but it's not based on one week. It's over the season. So those games will get made up. Yeah, players who miss games, it's still going to be a problem, but it can be mitigated. And if you haven't played a rotisserie league, this is the year to do it because it is the best format, I believe, for the COVID uh, situation that we're in. Points league is another type of league. So basically it is like a head-to-head -head league where it's you versus your opponent, except you don't battle on categories. It's like each category is assigned a points number. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then your player gets 30 points. They get 40 points. And then however many points your team gets versus your opponent, who, who gets the most points, the same as fantasy football, wins that week. And they get one win for the week. I really don't like points leagues. Um, someone did ask me to talk about best ball leagues. And what a best ball league is, well, basically... In best ball is more of a football format. In basketball, it's more of a... And to do best ball, it needs to be a points league, really. In basketball, we're looking more at draft-only leagues. So you do the draft, and that's it. No trades, no waiver moves. You just have everyone on your team, and they just accumulate either categories or points during the season. And at the end of the year, you see who comes out on top. So that strategy changes because you can't make moves. You can't like, oh, well, I'll grab this guy, and then maybe in four months' time, the starter in front of him will get traded because you have to deal with his nonsense at the beginning of the season. There is a little bit of different strategy that goes into a best ball league. And if you have got you know two or three regular leagues and you go, man, I really love drafting, go and join five, 10 best ball leagues because you can just do those drafts or those draft only leagues, do the drafts and then forget about it. Check back at the end of the season and see how you went. And again, check out uh, Hidden Upside or Dynasty ADP, NBA Dynasty ADP on Twitter. And they have a bunch of leagues over at Fantasy Basketball International, including some draft only leagues over there as well. And there is a link below in, my, uh, in the description or in the show notes that does talk about uh, or shows you where to go to get the Fantasy Basketball International leagues cracking. Bill, go. If you want to crack on in the middle of your afternoon, you've hit the wall, mental, physical, whatever it is. Built Go is that solution to break through the wall. Sometimes, yeah, you know, I'm up. I get up super early. Yeah, you know, I'm up six, six thirty working, and by the time I hit three o'clock, I'm like, I'm stuffed. I'm like, I need something to get me through the rest of this day. Built Go is there for you. It's a one and a half ounce package of energy gel combined with collagen protein. It's the best workout gel on the market, but it helps if you also just, you know, you're struggling through your day mentally and physically. Three delicious flavors: peanut butter, honey, chocolate, coconut, and chocolate mint. The Built Go is loaded with beta alanine, B3, B6, B12, honey, and some caffeine as well, as well as that collagen protein, which helps promote joint, soft tissue, hair, and skin health. Visit builtgo.com, use the promo code LOCKED, and you'll get 20% off your next order. So use the promo code LOCKED for 20% off at builtgo.com. Let's go. Don't forget, guys, subscribe to this show, because um, tomorrow we've got another show coming up. We're going to be talking about how to do an auction draft for tomorrow's show. And then later in the week, as I mentioned, talk about how to uh, how to do a snake draft and how to do uh, punting categories. So they're the shows that are coming this week. So make sure you are checking them out. On to the next things. Setting up a league. How many teams are you having? In general, the best number of teams is 12. Um, 14 is fine. 10 is a, Anything less than 10 is a bit shallow. To me, eight teams, it's, just, it's, it's not that fun. 10 is, pro if you're going to do 10 as well, I would expand your rosters out. Now, in general, a 12-team league has 13 roster spots. I'm probably more in, in favor of having 14 roster spots. A, it makes the draft a little bit more even because otherwise you have the player who picks first overall picks first in seven rounds and then picks last in six. If you have 14 rounds of your draft, everyone, or he gets to pick first in seven and last in seven. It's, a little, it, it's not quite as even, but it is a little bit more even. Anyway, I think 12 teams with 13 players, which is the standard, gives you 156 players rostered. So if you go down to a 10-man league, you want to increase your rosters to be 15-man rosters to give you that sort of same depth. It gives you a decent amount on the waiver wire, but it doesn't mean that you've just got a bunch of really good guys sitting out there on the wire that can be churned through. So I think getting that balance right is important. Uh, I've got here on the notes, if you can see on the graphic, the All-Star break. Now, most people will combine the two weeks around the All-Star break. But this year, we're in a different scenario. We've just got five days off. But what I would still do, there's no all-star game, so it's not that the full break, but I would still do it so that that week where you have the five days off, the two weeks around that, or you combine, you, know, you have five days off out of 14 days. So you have like an extra long week, a nine game week across fantasy basketball. So make sure your league is set up to have that combined week rather than like a three-day week and a four-day weeks, two separately. You're going to have more problems again with COVID and players sitting out. You don't want to play a four-day uh, four week. You'd much rather a nine-day a nine matchup. 
when to end your league is a comment that is, you know, or question that is asked to me all the time. Josh, when do I best end the league? Now, the league is scheduled to end on the uh, 15th of March, I believe. Uh, sorry, try again. On the 15th of May. Now, let me just, no, that, that, that's true. It's, we're, we're scheduled to end around that, around that time, the, the 15th of May. So what I would suggest is have your playoffs end three weeks before that. You want your playoffs to end, which would be on, uh, sorry, not the not the 15th. It is the 16th of May, my bad, 16th of May. So I think you want your playoffs to end on the 25th of April. And yes, the season's a little bit shorter. You want it, you, people are trying to jam games in. So much nonsense goes on in those last couple of weeks. I, I think that's my rule always. It's always, my rule is always never play into April, but that's of course skewed. I would say 25th of, of April is a good time to end, but with the play-in tournament, meaning we've got 10 teams fighting for playoffs, with 10 games locked off the schedule, meaning it's harder to be out of the playoff race earlier, I don't hate ending it on the 2nd of May. So that gives you two full weeks of no action. So I don't mind ending your playoffs on the 2nd of May. So it's either going to be the 25th of April or the 2nd of May that I believe that you should end your fantasy season. Playoff format, um, really up to you. The, the standard is 12 teams. You have a, a six-team playoff with um, you know, the, the top two teams getting a bye. Now, the benefit for this is, is you have more teams in the playoffs meaning that players are engaged longer throughout the season so that they don't give up. Because if someone is down the bottom of their league, they will tend to give up over you know, week 16 or week 17. And then whoever takes on those guys at the end of their schedule um, gets a bit of an advantage. So having more playoff teams rather than less is probably a better way to keep um, teams invested and to keep the competition a little bit fairer. You could even go to eight playoff teams if you wanted, give no buy at all and play you know, 1v8 and then you know, down to 1v4 and then 1v2 in, in the finals matchup. I think that's a fair way to do it. Again, keeping everyone in the mix in the playoffs and you know, generally making that schedule a little bit fairer. Another thing with schedule that you can do is you can set it up on fan tracks to have that you play multiple opponents each week. Now, this can reduce some of the unfairness regarding games played, which is an issue. Hey, you had five more games than I had. If you play two opponents per week or three opponents per week, which is a way to do it, it does make your punting strategy and your streaming strategy a little bit harder to do. But I think it does make things somewhat fairer over the long run if you play multiple teams uh, each week. You set your one lineup, whatever it is, who, this is who you got or you, every day, and you take on those three different opponents at the same time. I think it makes it fairer. I think it also then makes that you play these opponents who are the good teams and the bad teams at different times through the year. So that evens the schedule up. So it is, if you're looking, for, again, for something to try different this season, try that feature. Play an opponent multiple times. We'll play multiple opponents in a week and see how that goes for you. And especially if your league is going big, if you've got a 20-team league, it's going to be really hard to play every team. Do that. Play multiple teams each week. Uh, I think that's a really interesting way to be able to, to run things. All right, so I talked about this a little bit already, but rosters, how many total players? I think in a 12-team league, you want 14. You want um, a minimum of 160 players rostered in general, so it's 15 to 16 in a 10-teamer. In a 14-team league, I wouldn't um, you necessarily drop it because... Yeah, you know, I would keep it at 14 players and that because the idea is you're in a deeper league, so you're pushing it deeper. So I think 14 is probably your ideal number. Take it to 16 if you're in a 10-team league. The question then is how many starters do you have? And the one of the things that I, I think, yeah, sorry, going back to overall players, given this COVID scenario um, and the way that things are probably going to go, I think expanding your rosters out is probably a little bit better as well. It's just having that extra space so that if a guy gets sick and he's out for a week with quarantining, you don't have to drop them. You've got an extra bench spot there. So if you do increase your roster to 14, don't increase your active spots. A standard is 10 actives and three bench. Make it 10 and four. If you go too much the other direction, if you say, well, I just want extra benches and we'll cut down starters, it does change your drafting strategy. So if you said, well, we've got 13 players, let's make it eight and five. I really don't like that because it means the back end of your draft really isn't that important. You'll have plenty of days where you've got guys who are actually playing a game sitting on your bench because you can't get them into a lineup. Your best bet is if you want a bigger bench, 
get a bigger bench. Don't take the bench spots out of the active lineup. So that's how I'd be looking at that. Try and keep whatever you had before, 10 actives, but make four bench spots. Make five bench spots if you want. IR, every league should have an injured reserve or an injured list or an inactive list. Every league should have it. There is no excuse not to. I do not subscribe at all to the idea that, nah, look, it's it's way more fun if you have to make decisions to cut injured players. It just screws the league up in my opinion. And in this year, one of the COVID settings you should have is multiple injured spots. I think you probably we were probably looking towards doing a standard of two IR spots anyway. So I think that two should be absolutely the default for every league this year. And I wouldn't hate going to three. A lot of people have asked me, Josh, should we have an IR spot that's for COVID only and then ex- expect the managers to police it that way? It's too bloody hard. Just have more IR spots. And if someone gets three guys go down with a pulled hammy in one week, then they can put them all on IR. If someone has three guys go down with COVID, they can put them all on IR. Because what you're also going to have is if guys have the, a coronavirus situation and the training has or practice has to get shut down or they can't practice for a couple of weeks, then that's going to increase uh, injuries, I believe, especially with a compressed schedule. So I'm not about, well, this is your COVID spot and this is your injured spot. Just have minimum two IR spots, probably go to three. So my COVID changes would be have at least um, 14 player rosters, 10 and four, maybe go 10 and five. I'm not against that and have two to three IR spots. It's going to make the draft go a little bit longer, a couple of rounds extra, and you're going to have that extra space. But I think overall, it's going to really help the, um, the the way your league looks. Now, another question is, what positions do you have? Absolutely, you should never have two centers. I think it's a horrible move to have that, which is Yahoo, Yahoo default. Do not do it. You should do the standard. Power, power forward, center, small forward, point guard, shooting guard. I don't know why I said them in that order. Do that. Have a generic guard spot, have a generic forward spot, and have your three utilities. That is the way that I think it should go. You could easily make an argument to me that instead of having point guard, shooting guard, and guard, you just have three guard spots and have three forward spots and then have a center and have three utilities. I don't have any problem with that at all. And in fact, I think that's probably um, a, a, a more useful setup, but just otherwise one of each of the five positions, guard, forward, three utilities, there's your 10 roster spots. Don't get two, de- definitely don't do two centers. It is a horrendous system in a league where centers are the most replaceable and marginalized position, forcing you to have two of them is just, it's not fun because you're going to have a lot of shit centers on rosters. Like who wants to be relying upon Cody Zeller because we need to have uh, you know, 24 active centers at, at, a, at a time. I just don't understand why we would do that as a setting when you know, point guard, you don't have two point guards, you don't have two small forwards. I, I just don't see the need for it. And you can make the argument, well, that's fine. Josh, but you know, if you have small forward, you have power forward, then you have that generic forward spot. That still means just one and a half small forwards, one and a half power forwards, yet two centers. We're still prioritizing that. What you can do is you can make that forward spot, the generic forward spot, a forward slash center spot. So you can use two centers if you want, and you can, or you can use three forwards if you want. It's really up to you. Plus, you've got your utility spots. You can put, you can stack them to the bloody rafters with centers if you want. I just don't think having a minimum two centers is something you should do. The other thing to talk about with rosters: do not have um, maximums. I know on ESPN, it's like, you've drafted four centers, so now you can't draft anymore. Get rid of it. There should be no positional maximums at all. If I want eight centers on my roster, I should have it. It probably won't work out, but I should have it. Get rid of all maximums for positions. It should not exist. And in default on Yahoo, you're going to have two centers as your starting requirement. Change it. On ESPN, your default's going to be max four centers. Change it. Absolutely get rid of it. It is a horrible setting, and it shouldn't be there. Guys, Locked On NBA. You know that I host it, but on Tuesday, it's a different show. East meets West in Locked On NBA Tuesdays. Wes Goldberg, Warriors beat writer for the Mercury News and the host of Locked On Warriors, and David Ramil, the host of Locked On Heat. They tackle the biggest NBA stories of the day, coast to coast. Subscribe to Locked On NBA Podcasts wherever you get podcasts. All right, so let's have a look at what else we've got to talk about with setting up a league. I've got a lot to get to. Now, scoring. Um, points leagues. The standard scoring system. Yahoo runs it. It's Fangio DFS scoring. Uh, I, I don't. I hate points leagues in general, but I don't mind the standard scoring. ESPN used to have their standard scoring as the plus one, minus one. So it was this plus one for everything, and then minus one for field goal attempts. They've changed their scoring up this year to a wild system: four points per steal, four points per block. 
If you hit a three, it's worth five points. If you make a two, it's worth three points. You lose points for missed free throws. It is a wild system. The points leagues system that I like is using game score. And you don't know, if you don't know what game score is, it's basically a point system based on um, PER, which, you know, PER is an, an old formula. It's not that great for determining value, but game score, what it is, it takes into consideration points, field goals made and field goals attempted. So efficiency is factored in, same with free throws attempted and free throws. It factors in more weight for offensive rebounds versus defensive rebounds, steals and blocks and assists have value uh, and it reduces, you lose value for fouls and you lose value for turnover. It's not a perfect system. I think it's significantly better than the plus one minus one. I think it's probably better than the new system for ESPN where three pointers are just heavily overvalued. Um, and I don't mind the standard Yahoo one, which is one point per point, 1.2 rebounds, 1.5 assists, three steals, three blocks, minus one for turnovers. I don't mind that one as well. Exotics, I've got there because you can have things like double-double bonuses and you know, triple-double points and uh, you know, offensive and defensive rebounding. It can get a little bit funky. I hate using techs or ejections. I hate those as categories and especially in your points leagues. I'm really not a fan of that at all. So let's talk categories. Eight category or nine category. We know the standard categories. Points, threes, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and turnovers. That's your standard nine category. For eight category, we just take turnovers out. I think ideally you want to play nine cat. Um, as much as I hate turnovers, I think having the ninth category in there so you've got an, an odd number of categories is fine. Now, you can work out ways to replace turnovers if you want. I haven't found a perfect option for it. I think ways to do it is, is splitting rebounds into offensive and defensive rebounds and taking out turnovers. It does overpower some guys, especially someone like Andre Drummond. The thing you can also do um, is take field goal percentage and take that out and split it into two-point percentage and three-point percentage. That's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of having three-pointers made as a category because, again, they double count in points. So that is, that's a little bit of an interesting one. And I'd like to get a way of having three-point percentage in there. I haven't found a perfect way to do this, to be honest. But there is there are ways you can do it. I think having true shooting percentage in is a, a good way to do it. But you don't want to have that doubling up with field goal percentage and free throw percentage because it's all counted together. So I think you could make an argument that you take field goals, free throws, and turnovers out and you replace them with true shooting percentage. Now, I'm not the greatest fan of that. That gives you seven categories. It's not ideal, but I don't mind it. I would also then consider taking three pointers out, um, and maybe you add assist to turnovers in that place, or you split your offensive and defensive rebounding up. I think there are ways to change the categories to better reflect basketball, but at this point, if you don't want to get too cute, just go with your standard nine categories. Now, double-doubles, hate it, and I'll tell you why. It's a double counter. You get a point, you get, points are a category, rebounds are a category. Double-doubles, if you get 10 points and 10 rebounds, you've already got 10 points, you've already got 10 rebounds, and now you just get a random double-double in there and you get one for it. So for a start, it's a binary category. It's either a one or a zero. You can't get anything more than that from a player. It is not a replaceable stat because you can't just go and stream in a double-double guy. Those guys are all gone. And in the top 60 of a draft, they're gone. And it's a category that doubles up with points and rebounds already or points and assists. Those categories are already being counted. So why are we making an arbitrary number of double figures meaning that you get a bonus point? And the same goes for triple-doubles. Triple-doubles are horrendous categories. They just don't happen that often. You might you know, see your matchup. You know, I've, I've 600 points versus 550 points one triple-double versus zero. Like You want your fantasy matchup to swing based on one uh, triple-double where Fat Face Ray Felton went out there and got 10, 10, and 10. I, I don't think so. And again, if you get 10, 10, 10, it's already counted in points, rebounds, and assists. So double-doubles, triple-doubles, piss them off. If you're going to put offensive rebounds as a category, you've got to remove total rebounds because again, it's a double counter. And this is why I don't like three-pointers as, as a three-pointers made as a category because it's double counter. I'd really like to find a better way. You know, you, everyone knows my ideal thing. I want hustle stats. I want hustle stats, screen assist, um, deflections, 
the loose ball gathers, those sort of things. I want those in there because I think they're a good uh, reflector of how the NBA works or some value to these players. And I think having hustle stats in, even replacing turnovers would be a really, really good way to go about getting fantasy in, but or getting fantasy better, but it's not supported by the stats providers over on the fantasy sites like Yahoo, ESPN, uh, Fantrax, CBS. It's just not supported, but I think that is the way to go about it eventually. Transactions and lineups, daily or weekly. Cannot stress enough that weekly lineups is bad. Yes, it's good if you have played fantasy football. Hey, I set it once a week, but the NBA is a daily sport. It's not a weekly sport. So if you set a daily a lineup at the start of the week and then one day in, your guy gets injured and he misses all four games that week and you've got a bloke sitting on the bench that was going to play four games, like, that's really not right. I don't like weekly transactions or yeah, weekly lineups. It should be daily. And while we're talking about that, I know a number of you would play fantasy football on Sleeper and they've expanded to basketball. Let me tell you why I dislike Sleeper a lot. They have points only, no categories. Horrendous. Points is, is it's just not fun. And the other thing they do is, it is, is it, you, you set your lineup for the week and you pick one game. LeBron plays four games this week, so you have to choose which game you're going to count. What if that's the one that he sits out or rests? You're just screwed. It's like weekly lineups, but somehow exponentially worse. So I could not recommend playing on Sleeper less with the formats they have. Points only and choose one game per week. It does not suit fantasy basketball. This is not how basketball is played. Lock time for transactions. You can either choose that you set your, your, your lineups can be changed at the tip off of the first game of the day, and then it's locked for the rest of the day. Or you can do it that each slot can be changed depending on when a player's game time starts. Now, it depends on the sort of guys you've got in your league. If they're going to be really you know, looking at their lineups significantly throughout, throughout the day. I think, sorry, I think all add drops should be locked by the first uh, transact, by the first tip of the day. You don't want to be adding guys in to play them later in the afternoon. But I think if your league is engaged, you want to be able to make changes up until the start of each game. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't really make that much difference. In terms of player acquisitions, you've got fab, you've got waivers, and you've got first come, first serve. First come, first serve just means whoever picks the guy up gets him. I don't like that for a few reasons. It means that you know, when a player goes down, whoever is you know, glued to the TV gets the benefit. And I don't think that that should be a pre prerequisite to playing in a fantasy league. That's why I like fab. And what fab is, is it's a daily auction. You get a budget, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you got it. And then you look at the players that you want, you put a bid on those players and the auction's protest, uh, processed. Whoever puts the most money on that player gets that player. Now, some people will say, yeah, but then Josh, if someone I see someone's hurt before tip-off, I can't add them in. I think that, well, that's a problem that goes to, towards everyone. But what you should look to do is um, ha have a look when you make your fab acquisitions, make multiple acquisitions, but do them all for the same player, right? So if you miss out on someone, You've got backups. So I have, let's use LeBron again. LeBron's, actually, it's not a bad, let's use Kyle Kuzma. For some reason, I was stupid and I drafted Kyle Kuzma. And now I want to drop him and I want to replace him with someone. So let's give me five different options and I prioritize them through either money or priority order. So I'll get this guy, but if someone else bids more, then it moves on to my second chance. And if someone bids more, I move to my third chance. So then you're always going to be assured of at least getting someone in to replace rather than like, well, I'm going to put five bucks on adding Danny Green to replace Kyle Kuzma. And then someone puts six bucks on Danny Green and you're left with frigging Kyle Kuzma. Give yourself multiple options because if the first one goes through, if Danny Green goes through for Kyle Kuzma, then your other transactions just disappear. They go away. That leads me to another thing about transactions is having a limit during the week. Usually the default is, uh, or what I think the default should be, is four transactions a week. It does help to reduce streaming a little bit um, and nullify the games played issue. I think with, again, with COVID this year, I wouldn't mind bumping that up to five. I think seven is probably going too far, but five or six I reckon is probably okay in this environment. Trade deadline, you've got to work out when your trade deadline is. Now have a look when your playoffs are. I'd do your trade deadline probably three weeks before your, uh, or even even do it do it there in that All Star break during March. I think that's probably as good a time as any to do it, or do it straight after the NBA trade deadline is another good time to do it. I think that they're probably your three options when looking at trade deadlines. Trade vetoes, get those all the way out of here. They should not exist. Commissioner only. 
You, can, you should not have a mechanism for other players to piss and moan about a trade that someone pulled off and then use their vote to reduce that. Get rid of it. Get it all the way out of here. I don't want to hear any argument. Oh, it's a legitimate reason. It's a legitimate situation where I can vote because it makes other teams better. Piss off. Nothing to do with you. Not your trade, not your vote, not your business. The only time a trade should be vetoed is when a commissioner looks at it and goes, huh, LeBron for Tony Snell? I think something might be up. And then you go talk to the blokes and goes, what are you dickheads doing? And you, and you veto the trade. Simple as that. And you give them a warning, and if they do it again, you kick their ass out. Commissioner doesn't, by having commissioner veto powers, doesn't mean that the commissioner goes, I think this is a fair trade, put it through. You put through trades. Unless it is cheating, it is put through. If someone says, I'm trading Kyrie Irving away, and I'm getting back Tobias Harris, and you go, man, Kyrie's the 10th ranked player, and Toby's the 60th ranked player, this is bullshit, I'm not doing it. And the other player goes, well, I'm worried that Kyrie is going to get hurt and he's going to miss the next 30 games. So I, I want to get out of the business of having an injury risk player on my team. That's not for you to decide as a commissioner. That's not for you to decide as other players in the league. It might work out brilliantly for that guy because Kyrie goes down and misses the rest of the season. It might work out terribly because Kyrie plays every game, but that is the risk that you do. That is not a cheating move. That is you taking that risk and thinking about it as a trader Thinking about, you know, can I deal with this risk? Have I also got Joel Embiid and Kawhi Leonard on my team where I just can't take this risk of him being out? So I've got to get some value. And I've shopped him around. The best I can get back is Tobias Harris. And you might look like an absolute genius in the end. You might look like an idiot, but that is your problem. That is your team. It is not cheating. That is not what vetoes are for. And I know I'm going on about this because I'm super passionate about it. League votes piss them off. Commissioner vetoes because he doesn't think it's fair. Not your business, mate. Just put the trade through and check for cheating. Simple as that. I've already talked about weekly transactions. Seasonal transactions, hate it. No, uh, Only 30 moves for the season. Get out of here with that nonsense as well. No need for it. Absolutely get rid of the max season uh, transaction cap. Absolutely ridiculous. ESPN and Fantrax has an option where you can limit the amount of games played per week. And a lot of people go, this is dumb because... Um, there's a loophole. And yes, there is a loophole, but it does put a limit on things. So I think a good way to do it is if you've got a 10 active spot roster with, um, well, 10 active spot roster, you set your limit to 38 games. That is the most that you can play for the week. Now, I don't like the situation where it goes, well, we have it where it's an honor system and you have to keep it to 38. And if not, the commissioner just voids your week. I don't mind the loophole. And the loophole being is that if you play 37 games up till Saturday, then you can go over it on the next day and you can play as many as you want. Now, being able to just stack up guys on the Sunday is why you have a transaction capping, whether it's four or five, whatever it is, so that you can't just go, well, I'm just adding nine new guys in on Sunday. Well, you wouldn't want to do that anyway because you're going to be dropping a lot of good players. Um, I, I don't mind it. Have that limit at 38. Have the loophole where you play 37 up to Saturday and then whatever you play on Sunday just pushes you over the limit. It doesn't actually influence as many matchups as you think. And then having other things in there, having fab, having weekly transaction limits, I think is something that is 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 a way to pre prevent that. Roto games limit. If you have a roto league, you've got to have a games limit. Every active position should match the amount of games for the season, which in this case is 72. Because of, um, I was going to say because of COVID, I wouldn't hate moving the games limit to say 75 and it allows a little bit more streaming. And the other thing is, if you have someone in an active spot and they are scheduled to play a game that day and then they don't, it doesn't count as a games played. The player has to actually play for it to count as a games played. So each active spot, set it at a 72 or maybe 75 game limit for the season. Don't have it, don't have it completely um, limitless because that's not a good way to play Roto Leagues in my opinion. Snake Draft. We'll talk about more of this uh, when we do the Snake Draft show, but options you can have is a third round reversal, meaning that the same person who picks first in round two also picks first in round three, and then we alternate after that. I think that's a bit of a fairer way to do it. You can have a slow draft or a standard draft. A slow draft where you have you know, multiple hours between picks, which is a good way if you've got people in different time zones and you want to get things started early. A standard is like a minute per pick. You make that decision depending on how your league goes. You can have an auto pick draft. Really stupid. Don't think that's really worth looking at. And the other question that people ask me quite a bit of is draft auto reveal. Josh, 
my commissioner doesn't want to tell us what the draft order is until an hour before the draft. That's bullshit as well. Just work out the draft order, however you want to do it. Random number generator. Um, yeah, who's got the biggest dick picks last. Whatever it is, get the draft order out because then it, you can work things up with trades. Draft pick trading is totally fine. You get anticipation and you get to think about what you're doing with your team. You get to go into mock drafts knowing what you're doing. And I think it works for a more a better league, a more competitive league because people have been able to prepare at a higher level and it rewards that preparation. Auction draft. We'll talk about this more again. Work out your budget. Standard is 20 minutes. Work out your time limits. How long is it to bid? How long is it to nominate? The length of your draft in terms of how how many rounds are you going? How, and how long is this? We're going to talk all about this later. This is just a primer. How long is an auction draft? It's normally double the length of a snake draft. So be prepared for that, even though it is the, the more superior way to do a draft. And then the other thing that's important, what's your minimum bid? Are you bidding $1 on players or are you bidding $0 on players? Because $0 is a possibility. And so the last couple of spots on your roster, you can fill out at no cost. And that changes the cost calculus for those early selections in an auction draft. So that's a decision you have to make. There's no right or wrong answer with that, but it does change what you do. Fees and prizes. What's your entry fee? Work it out. Doesn't matter what it is. It can be a thousand bucks, can be five bucks, can be ten bucks, can be you know whatever you want. And then work out your prize split. I think um, yeah, some people go, well, winner takes all, and that's great. It does lead, in my opinion, to you know players who are battling for a six seed in the playoffs, really maybe giving up a little bit early. Well, I'm not going to win anything, any money here. If you want things, if you want things to remain a little bit more competitive. You push the prizes out over more spots. Everyone makes the playoffs. You know, the, the, if you lose the first week of the playoffs, you get your money back. Uh, if you, you know, win the, the winners, you know, they get more money. Do it that way. It, it makes people more competitive because they've got a chance to still get some of their money back. So that's really up to you how you want to run it. Some people will be just like, you know, the first two teams, the teams that get to the grand final, uh, 67% to one team, 33 to the other. Everyone else can, can piss off. And it's really an individual decision. Transaction costs. Some some leagues have options where like every trade that you make, every waiver move that you make, you have to pay amount of money. I think it's stupid. I, I wouldn't do it. Last place penalty. I think this is interesting. You can also do it last place penalty. Uh, if you finish in, and this helps to prevent tanking a little bit, you got to go and buy beers for everyone when you go out. You got to buy your shout dinner. You've got to pay the entry fee to the winner of the league for the next season. Whatever you want to do, I don't mind as a punishment. People can come up with all sorts of uh, curious and fun things in their fantasy league to do as well. But I think it's not a bad thing to do. The other thing I don't like in terms of playoffs is consolation brackets. I, I really don't like that. Um, I just think once you're, once the playoffs are starting, the teams that are out of the playoffs shouldn't be making transactions. And who wants to play to see who finishes eighth or ninth? Unless you want to do something with a, a league that goes on year and year and year, where if you win that consolation bracket, you get the number one pick. I, I totally understand that. And you can do it. I, I'm just not big on that sort of a thing. And then the last couple of things we're going to talk about is tiebreakers. You know, if you do have a situation where your matchup is tied 4-4-1, who wins when you get to the playoffs? In the regular season, it doesn't matter. You just get 4-4-1. Four, four, or you know, if it's a most categories league, you get one, you get a tie. But in the playoffs, you've got to make, make a decision. I prefer to look at is who had the best um, regular season record. They get the tiebreaker. The other way you can do it is who won the head-to-head -head record. And the other way you can do it is using a specific category. So, okay, if we're tied, then whoever wins the points category wins the matchup. I really don't like that one. But you're know, doing it as who had the best regular season record is, I think, a way to go. COVID issues, like I talked about, increase your bench, increase your weekly acquisition limits, increase your injured reserve spots, play Roto. They're probably the biggest decisions there. And then you yeah, choose where you're going to go play, whether it's on Yahoo, ESPN, Fantrax, CBS, and Sleeper. I've talked about Sleeper already. Fantrax, absolutely the best place to go play Dynasty Leagues. I think Yahoo is a better option than ESPN. I love their auto start sit feature. Uh, again, the thing with Yahoo that I don't like is the um, the default two centers, which is something I think that needs to go away. So that is your basics of setting up a fantasy league. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, tweet them at me, drop them in the Discord server as well, and subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.